In May 2009, a YouTube user known as WildeBeast88883333 posted a video of him talking about a story of a day at school. The then sophomore student at Joplin High School in Missouri had a rather eventful school day before tennis practice. In this video, he talks about a close encounter with a tornado while he was driving. We finally go in the building and we go in the gym, no one's in there, and that's where we chill before school, but no one was in the gym. So we go to this tiny hallway with no windows, and that's where everyone is, because everyone's afraid there's gonna be a tornado. And I was like, there's not a tornado, and I look out at the tennis courts at the school, and the windscreens are flying off of the fences. So pretty much, I don't know what we're gonna do for tennis. I mean, we have the club. Anyway, um, and we're all sitting there, and I look around, and I'm like, wow, I'm the only person in my class here today. The bell rings, and everyone's like, okay, well, I guess get to class. And we were kind of like, uh, okay. He then ends the video, understandably tired from the day's events, and states that he will never drive in bad weather again, and thanks those who watched. That 16-year-old kid who uploaded this video was Will Norton, and he would tragically pass away just two years later, doing what he promised that he would never do, driving into the Joplin tornado. We would try and take a look outside with our weather camera. However, it is just so rain socked at this point in time. Yes. We really can't see up oh, there. Wow, look at that yep, shot. Yep, there's a look. The ability of producing funnel clouds has had the history of producing funnel clouds over the last couple of hours across portions of southeastern Kansas. And so it looks like it's going to continue. Public report, meaning that one of their train spotters hasn't seen it, but there's our tower cam. And that would appear to be a, a, a power flash. That could be from a lightning strike, but uh, that is the portion of the storm that we have been concerned with. In Southern Jasper, Northern Newton, take cover. Yes, please. Right now. Please I am to, telling you to yes, take, they, cover take cover right, right now. now. We do have a Folks, tornado on the ground. This is a tornado. Yeah, this is a very dangerous situation. We cannot stress this enough. If you are in Joplin, please take cover. One of the most infamous weather events in America, the Joplin tornado was a literal worst case scenario of a catastrophic tornado hitting a populated area. While this occurred less than a month after the 2011 super outbreak that produced 360 tornadoes in a span of four days, in some respects, the Joplin tornado overshadowed the outbreak altogether. The tornado was an EF-5 monster that brought a city of 50,000 people to its knees and left a scar on the surrounding area forever. I will be going over everything regarding this tornado, from the volatile atmosphere that allowed such a calamity to happen, to the devastating aftermath and miraculous recovery of Joplin. The Joplin tornado was part of a larger outbreak that occurred across the country from May 21st to May 26th, 2011, with 239 tornadoes touching down in that time period, second only to the 2011 super outbreak. Of those, only five were violent EF4 or EF5 tornadoes, which is why this was not designated as another super outbreak. This extreme number of tornadoes was driven by several conditions in the atmosphere that would persist for several days. First, an unusually warm late spring had hit across much of the country, with temperatures in some areas being up to 10 degrees warmer than average. This was backed up by an extreme amount of moisture that moved in from the Gulf of Mexico from Texas all the way to New England. Dew points in the Midwest were in some cases close to 70 degrees Fahrenheit compared to temperatures in the mid to upper 70s made it a very moist setup for severe weather to build up with room to spare. The third was Arctic air from Canada that would drive south and east through much of the United States starting around May 20th and would pay dividends in the following days. On May 21st, the outbreak began as a low pressure system developed in the Dakotas and would rapidly intensify throughout the day. All the while, a powerful cold front and dry line developed in Kansas. With the insane moisture from the Gulf and the incoming cold and dry air from the West, a large amount of instability in the atmosphere resulted and allowed for a line of supercells to develop in both Kansas and Oklahoma. 
These supercells produced 18 tornadoes across much of the region. Most of these tornadoes were EF0s or EF1s, but one EF3 would carve a path southeast of Emporia, Kansas. This tornado would kill one person, injure five others, and leave millions of dollars in damage in its wake. While this wasn't a noteworthy tornado outside of those affected, it would serve as an ominous prelude to something much worse. The environment on May 22, 2011 was unusual across Joplin, with temperatures overnight staying around 72 degrees when they normally would drop to the lower to mid 60s. This was mainly due to the high humidity and dew points present that night, with a dew point recorded at around 64 degrees for much of the night. The temperature would then begin to warm up as the morning began, but it was understandably muggy and very humid on graduation day for the seniors at Joplin High School. The class of 2011 that day would be receiving their diplomas, unaware of what was to come just a few hours later. Even looking at data at 7 a.m. that morning in nearby Springfield, there was plenty of red flags that something bad was going to happen. The most obvious sign of trouble was the 0 to 1 kilometer shear. The shear at this level was veering or rotating clockwise with height at an angle of around 120 degrees. If that wasn't concerning enough, there was over 30 knots of shear that low to the surface, which is a great amount of shear to have. The Cape values that morning were over 1600 joules per kilogram, which is a good amount of instability for 7 o'clock that morning. However, one thing holding back the severe weather from initiating was a very strong cap, which is a stable layer of atmosphere that prevents bad weather. The cap measured at over 200 joules per kilogram, and as you can see on the skew, it's a very large amount to overcome. However, as the temperature began to rise throughout the day, the cap eroded, and by 1 p.m., the cap was nearly gone, and the cape had more than doubled to over 3,400 joules per kilogram, which is a very large amount of instability for severe weather to work with, and with a rapidly degrading cap, it was only a matter of time before it, break th before it broke through. Whenever the cap breaks, it always breaks explosively and allows for rapid initiation of severe thunderstorms. This would only get worse as by the time the thunderstorms that would impact Joplin formed, they had over 4,000 joules of instability to work with and they would not waste any time using it. At 1.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the SPC issued a tornado watch for southwest Missouri until 9 p.m. with, quote, explosive thunderstorm development is expected within the next one to two hours, with, quote, a strong tornado or two possible. Convection would then fire up in southeastern Kansas between 2 and 3 p.m. and would rapidly strengthen into severe thunderstorms as it began to tap into the extreme instability in their path. One of these thunderstorms became supercellular as it approached the Kansas-Missouri border and showed a strong hook echo as it began to organize and approach Joplin. The supercell then showed signs of tight rotation on radar at around 5.15 p.m. And two minutes later, the National Weather Service issued a tornado warning for Newton County, Missouri for the possibility of a tornado. Sirens began to go off across Joplin. However, in their report on the aftermath of the tornado, quote, the majority of Joplin residents did not immediately take protective action upon receiving a first indication of risk, usually via the local siren system, regardless of the source of the warning. Many first chose to further assess their risk by waiting for and actively seeking and filtering additional information before taking proactive actions. The reasons for this varied, but the biggest factor was, quote, the perceived frequency of siren activation in Joplin led to the majority of survey participants becoming desensitized or complicit to this method of warning. This apparent complacency would ultimately prove to be catastrophic, as in a scenario like this, every second counts, and with a lead time of 19 minutes, there was plenty of time to find adequate shelter. However, complacency was not only to blame, as other factors outside of everyone's control was also to contribute. At 5.34pm, the tornado touched down 
a half a mile east of the Kansas-Missouri border and was spotted by several storm chasers. Within a matter of moments, however, the tornado rapidly intensified and turned into a multi-vortex wedge, all caught on camera. The tornado's rapid development continued as it barreled towards Joplin. The tornado then entered Joplin at 5.36 p.m. as an EF3 tornado and began to devastate homes and buildings alike. The tornado then became violent as it approached Schifferdecker Avenue, and homes, businesses, and several medical buildings were flattened in this area, with even concrete walls collapsed and crushed into the foundations. One large steel reinforced step door structure, quote, deflected upward several inches and cracked in one of the medical buildings. Steel trusses from some of the buildings were, quote, rolled up like paper, and twisting of the main support beams occurred with this tornado. One infamous area where the damage became not only apocalyptic, but was so thorough that it would be known around the world, was the area around St. John's Regional Medical Center and the hospital itself. The hospital suffered a direct hit by the now EF5 tornado and lost nearly every window on three sides, carving out entire interior walls, tore out ceilings, and part of its roof. The flight helicopter stationed to airlift patients, if needed, was also blown away and destroyed by the tornado, with wind speeds estimated at over 200 miles per hour. The backup generators were also destroyed and would lead to five deaths in the hospital. The hospital was hit so hard that the structure was so damaged that it was deemed unsafe to rebuild and was torn down at a later date. Vehicles were thrown like toys across the sky and were mangled beyond recognition, including a semi-truck that was thrown 125 yards and wrapped around a debarked tree. Concrete parking stops were also completely lifted and carried up to 200 feet away from their origin point, and even the concrete in part of the parking lot was lifted. After decimating the hospital, the tornado maintained EF5 intensity as it slabbed entire neighborhoods in Joplin, while crossing Route 43 between 20th and 26th Street. At some residents, reinforced concrete porches were deformed or in some cases completely torn off as the tornado progressed. It would heavily damage every business along its path and virtually obliterated several institutional buildings. In one saving grace of the whole apocalyptic event, the tornado tracked just south of the downtown region and thankfully missed it narrowly. However, Another tragedy was just beginning as the tornado approached Joplin High School, with the graduation ceremony ending shortly before the tornado struck the town. Here, another miracle had happened, as the ceremony was not held at the high school that day. Rather, it was held at Missouri Southern State University, three miles away from the high school. This undoubtedly saved many of the students, as the tornado slammed into the high school at EF5 intensity, causing extensive damage to the school and dislodging its foundation. 
The tornado was also so strong that small pieces of cardboard were implanted into the walls that remained, and steel beams and pieces of fencing were deeply embedded into the ground in fields near the high school. Steel fence posts were also bent towards the ground in opposite directions. The tornado also leveled Franklin Technology Center and Greenbrier Nursing Home, the latter resulting in 21 deaths. The tornado had become increasingly rain-wrapped and would become much more difficult to see as it continued to plow through Joplin. This did not weaken the tornado's intensity at all, with the F5 damage continuing as it decimated the neighborhoods between 13th and 32nd Street, with the tornado reaching its widest point at over a mile wide. At this point, a Home Depot store, a Walmart, and a Pizza Hut were flattened by the tornado. In an act of heroism and bravery, the store manager of the Pizza Hut, Christopher Lucas, ushered four employees and 15 customers into the walk-in's freezer that was the most interior part of the building. After these people made it into the freezer, Lucas attempted to shut the door behind him, but was unable to due to the force of the tornado already destroying the building. Using a bungee cord and raw strength, Lucas held on to the door and kept it closed as long as he could before the tornado ripped the door off its hinges and he was sucked into the tornado. He was tragically killed as the tornado overtook him while saving 19 others. Asphalt and concrete were also scoured and lifted into the tornado while cars were thrown hundreds of yards. The tornado then continued to destroy several apartment complexes and two cell towers, which would make connection more difficult for the subsequent response. There were also motorists who were unknowingly driving towards and away from the tornado as it was plowing throughout Joplin, and many deaths occurred due to the tornado overtaking their vehicles, including Will Norton. The story of his death is indeed tragic, but the grim detail that his family describes makes this even more disturbing and goes to show the raw strength of the tornado. As Will and his father Mark were on their way home from the graduation ceremony, the weather around them rapidly deteriorated, as the rest of the family, including Will's mother and his sister Sarah, made it home just minutes earlier. Mark called Sarah on the phone and told her to open the garage door so that when he and Will got home, he could drive right in and get inside. However, as the garage door was going up, the power at the home unexpectedly cut due to the tornado knocking the power lines in the area. Sarah then calls her father back and informs him of the misfortune, but according to her, all she could hear was a deafening sound through the phone due to how powerful the wind was. This deafening sound was soon broken by Mark, who then said, Will, pull over. There's the tornado. Pull over. Seconds later, all that Sarah could hear was the sounds of crashing and the tornado barreling through before the phone disconnected. In that time frame, the tornado overtook Will and Mark's car as it lifted off the ground and tossed into a nearby pool. However, in the time between, Will desperately tried to hold on as his father grabbed him and tried to keep him in the car. Tragically, Will's seatbelt snapped and within a matter of seconds, he was sucked into the tornado through his sunroof, never to be seen alive again. Will's body was found several days later in the bottom of a nearby pond. Shockingly, Mark survived the impact of the tornado, unlike many others who were not so lucky. The passing of Will Norton is regarded as one of the most infamous events of the Joplin tornado due to the complete detail of it as it was happening and the video he posted two years earlier. Life is not without irony as he unknowingly drove into the one thing he said he would never drive into. Extensive damage continued as the tornado continued eastward. Many homes and industrial commercial buildings in southeast Joplin were flattened and the industrial park in the area was obliterated, with nearly every building flattened. Several large metal warehouse structures were slabbed, and several heavy industrial vehicles were thrown up to 400 yards away from this area. The last area of EF5 damage occurred in the industrial park, and a nearby gas station was annihilated. 
Many homes were destroyed further to the east at EF3 to EF4 intensity and a nearby subdivision, and East Middle School sustained major damage from the now weakening tornado. The tornado then exited Joplin and approached I-44, throwing cars and trucks alike. After slamming through the I-49 US-71 interchange, the tornado then affected rural areas before dissipating at 6.20 p.m leaving behind the most infamous weather event of 2011. The tornado's track extended over 21 and a half miles, mainly impacting Joplin through most of its life cycle. The tornado would go on to kill 158 people, though the city of Joplin puts this at 161 people, with over 1,000 people injured. This tornado was the worst tornado in terms of casualties since the Nikes compared to Xenia would result in one of the most resilient recoveries a disaster struck town would ever see. Having been warned of the mass exodus of residents by the federal government, Joplin would respond by rebuilding five homes per week to get families who were affected by the tornado back to their homes. Most of the businesses shockingly rebuilt and reopened, and hundreds of new businesses moved into Joplin between 2011 and 2016. Joplin High School, which suffered a direct hit by the wedge tornado, would be torn down and rebuilt, with students attending classes in other locations for up to three years before the school reopened in September 2014. And most critically, the St. John's Regional Medical Center was torn down due to stability issues and rebuilt as Mercy Hospital, which would open in 2015. The city of Joplin also added one more thing to remember those lost by the tornado, a memorial constructed in Cunningham Park commemorating the 161 people lost in the tornado as the town rebuilt and recovered. The Joplin tornado was the worst tornado disaster in the United States in 75 years and will be remembered for the high death toll, the ferocity of the tornado itself, and the resilience of a town that was destroyed by an EF5 tornado. I am Pat's Path Predictor, and thank you for watching. I would like to thank a couple of people who helped inspire me to make this documentary. The first is Sarah Norton, the sister of Will Norton, who described her experience with the Joplin tornado in a video that will be in the description down below. Without her and her father Mark's accounts, this documentary wouldn't be possible. So I want to thank you both, and may God the Father bless you and your whole family, especially Will. The second person I'd like to thank is Nick Crowley, who uploaded a video about nine and a half months ago at the time of this documentary being uploaded, talking about the Joplin tornado and Will Norton's 2009 video that I started this documentary with. It was part of his YouTube Starkist video series, and I wanted to thank him for showcasing that video, as well as the aftermath in his documentary, and if you want to check out some of his content, his channel is in the description down below. If you would like more documentaries like these, be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. With that being said, have a wonderful day, guys. Stay safe.